people tend to oversimplify the midday slump. Yeah, they think that the midday slump is just their caffeine crash, and it's just this super simple thing. The fact is, there's lots of different complex things going on within your body that cause you to crash at 12, 1, or 2 p.m. So let's go ahead and let's go through four very specific ways that you can overcome the midday crash without just having to reach for another cup of coffee. Now, full disclaimer, I love my coffee. I'm a big fan of coffee, so I'm not saying don't drink coffee. I'm just saying that later on in the afternoon, it's not always practical to be consuming a big old cup of joe because it might keep you up, and it's just not always the best way to keep your energy up sort of artificially inflated like that. So in this video, we'll break down four very specific ways. But first, you are tuned in to the internet's leading performance, nutrition, and fat loss channel. There's new videos coming out every single Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time. And if you've been following my channel, then you know that we don't just post videos then. We post them all the time. Also, I wanna make sure you hit that little bell button so you can turn on notifications and know whenever I go live or post a new video. And please head on over to highlead.com so you can check out the latest and greatest premium performance apparel that I'm always wearing in my videos. All right, Let's go ahead and dive right into this. So the first thing is gonna be something pretty straightforward, and honestly, something that you've probably heard of before, and that is pushing your carb consumption to later in the day. Okay, now I don't care if you are keto or not keto. Allocating your carbs towards later in the day has a huge effect on your energy levels and can really fight fatigue. See, it comes down to two very important things. The first one is one that you've obviously probably heard of before. That's the blood sugar rise and fall. Then the other one is the tryptophan relationship. When we consume carbohydrates, it spikes our insulin, which allows tryptophan, an amino acid, to get into the brain and trigger the production of melatonin and serotonin, which relaxes us and puts us to sleep. Not something we want when we're in the middle of the day. You see, the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition actually published a study. I thought it was pretty interesting. They took a look at three different groups. They took a look at a pure carbohydrate consumption group, a group that just consumed relatively high glycemic carbs throughout the course of the day. Then they looked at a mixed nutrient group, so a group that consumed carbohydrates, proteins, and fats throughout the course of the day. And then they looked at a pure fat group, so something a little bit more similar to like a ketogenic diet. Well, what they were measuring was the effect on fatigue and perceived fatigue. It was pretty wild stuff. What they found is that the group that consumed the mixed nutrient diet and the pure fat diet had much more sustained levels of energy throughout the course of the day, but only the pure fat consumption group saw improvement in energy in conjunction with improvement in mood and reduced fatigue. See, they found that the pure carbohydrate group two to four hours later had over a 100% increase in fatigue, okay? purely showing that, of course, it's the blood sugar, but also the tryptophan. So if you know you're gonna get fatigued because of the carbohydrates, just allocate them later into the day. You see, personally, I even allocate a lot more of my protein towards later in the day, simply because it can have a gluconeogenesis response and still spike my blood sugar. I wanna maintain even blood glucose and insulin levels throughout the course of the day, always the goal. The number two is going to be switching to theocrine plus theanine later in the day instead of caffeine. You see, theocrine is something pretty interesting, and I've done videos on it before. It's very, very similar to caffeine, with the exception of it having what is called a ketone added to the imidazole ring. Okay, it also has an additional nitrogen added to the open methyl group. This is complex biochem, but basically it's caffeine slightly differently structured. So basically it still comes from a standard caffeine source, not from like a cocoa bean or anything like that, but like from the kucha plant, it just doesn't have the same effects as caffeine in terms of habituation and tolerance. So it still works on your adenosine receptor, still makes you energized, and it still works on your D1 and D2 dopamine receptor. So it still gives you that sense of well-being that you want from typical caffeine consumption. So the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition published a really wicked cool study. Okay, they took a look at theocrine and they wanted to see how it had an effect on habituation and tolerance. Okay, so what they did is they took a group of people and divided them into three separate groups. A placebo group, a 200 milligrams of theocrine group, and a 300 milligram of theocrine group. They looked at them for eight weeks and what they found is that theocrine had absolutely no effect on habituation. They didn't form any habits. They didn't have any tolerance buildup, meaning they could take the same dose for the same amount of time and not ever have to increase their dose, but they also had no change in heart rate or no change in blood pressure as far as safety markers were concerned. That is very powerful stuff. Okay, so additionally, no jitters, nothing like that. So you're dealing with something that's giving you energy, but without the side effects. Again, not saying that caffeine is bad, but later in the day, this might be something you wanna go for. 
All right, the thing we want to talk about adding to the mix is theanine. Theanine is just a simple amino acid, okay? Nothing super crazy, except for the fact that it does something very unique inside your brain. You see, we have something that is called glutamate and GABA. Glutamate is something that provokes you to be a little bit more anxious. It's like the energizing portion of the brain. Then you have GABA, which stands for gamma aminobutyric acid. GABA is what allows you to actually relax and stay calm. And we're always in a balance of glutamate and GABA. If we have too much glutamate, we're amped up. If we have too much GABA, we're sleepy. It's a delicate balance. The interesting thing is theanine is an amino acid that looks a lot like glutamate. So it goes into the brain and it occupies the glutamate receptor, which means it blocks glutamate from hitting the brain, which means you have a bigger abundance of GABA, which means you're more relaxed, you're more calm. But additionally, Theanine does some interesting stuff as far as your alpha waves are concerned. It encourages your brain to go into an alpha wave state. Okay, this would be like seven to 14 hertz, which means that your brain is a little bit more relaxed. You're almost more in a meditative state where you're thinking clearly, you're less reactive. So combine that with the energy from theocrine, you've got a really wicked cool combination that is gonna outperform caffeine, at least as far as the afternoon is concerned. Which brings me right into the next thing that you can do. Plug into some binaural beats for just a few minutes, like five minutes. Okay, binaural beats aren't some woo-woo witch doctor thing. Binaural beats are really, really cool. And if that doesn't prove that frequencies and energies have an effect on our brain, I don't know what will. You see, binaural beats do something interesting. What they do is they measure sort of the delta between two frequencies. So for example, if you have 200 hertz coming into your left ear through a noise in one headphone, and you have 210 hertz coming into your right ear through the other headphone, your brain can't really ascertain what the actual frequency is. So what it does is it creates the delta between the two. So 200 hertz here, 210 hertz here, your brain says, oh, the difference is 10 hertz. So it puts you into a 10 hertz brainwave state. Okay, now I'll give you another example just so it's crystal clear. If you have 100 hertz coming into this here and 120 hertz coming into this here, your brain is going to find the difference between the two, which is going to be 20 hertz, which means your brain is going to go into that wave state. You can literally force your brain into a certain wave state. Now, alpha waves are gonna be seven to 14 hertz. Alpha waves are what allow you to feel sort of relaxed, but yet still awake, okay? Beta hertz are gonna be like 14 to 15 to 30 or 31 hertz. Okay, this is what you are at most of the time when you're just conscious, okay? You're awake, you're focused, yada, yada. Then you can go extremely high if you want. You can go 31 hertz to 100 plus hertz. That's hyper-focused. When you are like super focused on something, let's say you're skydiving and you're nervous and you're having to focus on making sure you pull the chute, yada, yada, that is gamma. Okay, you can put yourself there too. Very cool way to sort of biohack your way through the rest of the day without caffeine. Lastly is going to be walking and standing intermittently. This sounds funny, right? This sounds like so pathetically juvenile, like kindergarten stuff. You're like, Thomas, I watch your videos and you're always giving me complex stuff and here you are telling me to get up and walk throughout the course of the day. Come on, get real. Okay, the fact is, there's some pretty compelling evidence that shows that just getting up and doing something vigorous for like five minutes every hour is exceptionally powerful and can really make or break the course of your day. There's an interesting study that was published in the International Journal of Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity. So what they did, they took a look at three groups. One group sat down, sedentary, six hours, okay? Another group, worked out or did some kind of physical activity one period of time throughout the course of their day and then sat down for six hours. Or maybe they did it in the middle of their sitting period, whatever. Okay, just one workout bout. Okay, another group got up for five minutes every hour and did moderately vigorous activity. So maybe walking on an incline treadmill, maybe doing a couple pull-ups, maybe doing some mountain climbers, something moderately intense. Well, the results were pretty interesting. So the one-time movement group and the six-time movement group both saw an increase in energy, okay? That goes without saying. You probably have endorphins and things like that. But only the six-time interval group saw a decrease in appetite and an increase in mood and an increase in energy, showing that just simply getting up is going to have a huge effect on your energy, but also your mood. But more importantly, for you that are watching this video, probably a decrease in appetite. I think the little spike of catecholamines, the little spike of adrenaline that comes up every time you do a little short bout of working out makes it so that you have no desire to eat. It's pretty powerful stuff. So I hope that you share this with your friends and family. I hope that you learn something out of it because you don't just have to reach for that cup of joe. You don't just have to reach for something sweet or carbohydrates. You don't have to do that. There are some ways that you can biohack your way through the day so that long-term you live a good, healthy life while still performing your absolute best and most optimal state that you could possibly imagine. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you in the next video.